director of contemporary design, and we're here to celebrate storytelling. We have a really fun event planned. There's going to be three micro lectures by fascinating personalities, including myself. And those will be interleaved with hyper-competitive cutthroat rounds of design trivia led by the great Adam Kesner, this evening's Minister of Information. Um, and we're going to have um, a book signing upstairs. We'll keep the uh, shop open for you to do your holiday shopping. I sure hope you're a member because it's cheaper if you are. Um, there'll be more opportunities for a glass of wine. Um, we're going to be giving out uh, prizes for the top score scorers in the trivia game. There's also going to be a prize for the most creative Instagram story. So if you know what that is, you're one step ahead. Um, be sure to tag your story at Cooper Hewitt so that our amazing social media guru, Greg Gessner, can pick the winner tomorrow morning and send you, guess what, a free book. Um, so tonight's talks, um, I'm going to talk about my book, uh, Design and Storytelling. The amazing Peter Mendelssohn, who has designed probably read in the last five years. We'll talk about his work. Um, and Dan Venny, sound designer from Man Made Music, Dan Venn, is going to talk about what he does, um, which is storytelling with sound. Um, I wanted to say a very special thank you to my colleague, Susanna tonight, who really um, organized this event and made it as creative as it is. She found Adam Kessner in Brooklyn. You know it's cool. Um, this is, she's our, our uh, public programs coordinator. This is her last public event here, and I think it's going to be her funnest and most creative. So every time you laugh, thanks. Susanna Brown, thank you. Um, so I'm going to just start for a few minutes and, and tell you about this book uh, called Design is Storytelling, which was published by Cooper Hewitt uh, and came out uh, two weeks ago, hit the, the newsstands if those still exist. Um, writing a book is a really awful experience. It's like being pregnant for two years. And when you're done, you want to have an episiotomy for your brain. <laughs> Ladies, you know what I mean. Um, and there are moments of incredible self-doubt and pain and times when you think maybe you shouldn't do this book at all. I was at a conference in New Orleans about halfway through this project, uh, sitting with some you know, hip young people talking about what we were doing. And, and, and one of the young men asked me, well, what is your project? And I said, I'm doing a book about design and storytelling. And he looked very concerned. And he said, um, have you heard about the mantle of bullshit? And I had not. And I, it was explained to me that the great Stefan Sagmeister had a video that was, as they say, viral at the time about the mantle of, of bullshit. And that he had met a roller coaster designer who claimed to be a storyteller. And Stefan did not like this. He felt that roller coaster designers design roller coasters. And trying to call it a story is kind of phony. You know, it's like trying to add sauce uh, to your pizza. Um, and I felt very worried about this. Um, but I watched the video and got some lessons from that. But the more I thought about it and the more I soldiered on with my project, I thought, well, stories and roller coasters do have something in common. So there's a very famous diagram of the structure of stories that, that many writers use and that we use to really think about how to create energy in the story. And so a story, it starts out low, and you have an initial situation, and the energy builds, literally, you're collecting energy as you move to the top, and you hit a climax, you go down the other side, and it looks kind of like 
a roller coaster. Um, and that's what Grant Snyder thought when he made this amazing illustration for the New York Times book review um, that he let us use in our book. I love this. And it takes you through all the kind of cliches of what can go wrong in a story and turns it into a wonderful theme park. And somewhere there is the puddle of bullshit where you might get drowned and destroyed. And it turns out that human beings actually are attracted to a lot of things that have this shape. So if you think about lunch, you know, it starts out, you're hungry, you're, you're full of anticipation, there's an initial inciting incident, and then it gets more exciting, you're actually eating the lunch, and then it's over, you're satisfied. Um, sexual activity, when it works out, can be like that. I'm kind of wondering about the Twin Peaks here. <laughs> I want to call up the scientists and say, girlfriend, you got to share your research with me. <laughs> I'm not sure about that part. Um, and if we think about design and design being the representation of action, but also an invitation for users to perform an action, uh, many of the things that we do every day have been designed to have this kind of cycle of beginning, middle, end. Um, that's your desktop on a Macintosh computer. And we could change the way it ends. You know, this is maybe for the age of Elon Musk, a new interface design. But we have that sense of an ending, right, of something coming to a completion. Um, and so many things that we love and encounter every day come in threes, uh, beginning, middle, end. I collect pictures of trash cans. Please send them to me. I really do want your pictures. And I'm fascinated by how many trash cans come in threes, even though there's so many more kinds of trash than that. Somehow it comforts us. Um, and designers have created all these different openings to kind of invite your action, to get you to put your trash in the right place. That This version is um, Cooper Hewitt's, and it's kind of a Bauhaus version. Um, this one always looks kind of naughty to me. Uh, like, put your junk in one of these openings, depending on what you're into. Um, and lots of other things have that kind of arc. This is a diagram of the sound envelope. And every sound has a shape. It enters the world. It literally builds energy. It has a period of sustaining and time and disappearing. Um, and when you edit sound, you're actually looking at that arc. Uh, so one of our presentations tonight is all about sound and telling stories with sound. Uh, and that's celebrating the opening of one of our exhibitions upstairs, Hear, See, Play, which is about designing with sound. Uh, and Dan Venn designed the sounds with his company, Man Made Music, uh, to really invite the public to explore designing with sound. So, so we'll hear from Dan uh, shortly. Um, his theory of the sonic burrito, you can learn more about upstairs. And this is a book cover by Peter Mendelssohn, which takes this idea of threes and beginning, middle, end, and basically shows you what a slave you are to language and numbers. I just love this thing. Um, it's such a great story with an inverted plot. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Adam Kesner to challenge your brains um, in a deadly round of design trivia. Thank you. I'm going to turn that up. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask some trivia questions, and you are not going to get all these questions right. Trust me on this. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to uh, uh, take a uh, guess, write down your answer, you know, uh, confer with your teammates. And then at the end, and then after each question, we're going to find out what the answer is. So we're going to do this quickly. Question number one. 
We're going to talk about Saul Bass to begin with. Uh, Saul Bass uh, perhaps is most famous for his collaborations with Alfred Hitchcock. For one point, name any two of the Alfred Hitchcock movies seen here that Saul Bass was involved with the uh, credits for. Any two of the three will get you the point. I know it says three. We're making it a little easier. <laughs> You, trust me, you'll be happy with that later. <laughs> All right, so we'll take about 15 seconds. Sounds about good. This is, this is where we'd have game show music if we were... Uh... All right, we good? All right, everyone take your final guesses. Pencils down. Pencils, yes, pencils down. <laughs> These three movies, Vertigo, Psycho, and North by Northwest, not of course in that order, it's Psycho, North by Northwest, and Vertigo, just to make it more confusing. All right, question number two, question number two. Oh, it's a great picture. A few years ago, uh, this high school student made news with his science project when he figured out that the government can save $370 million if they changed all of their fonts from Times New Roman to what font seen here? What slightly thinner serif font would save the government $370 million? Well, you can see Times New Roman is still in Times New Roman. Everything else, slightly thinner. Yep, it's a font you've all got on your computer. Take about 15 seconds, take a guess. Right? Do 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 do. All right, we good? All right, that would be Garamond. Yes! Oh, I, li I like seeing the fists up. I like seeing you got it. All right. Things are going to get a little bit trickier here. Here we go. Question number three. Question number three. Lucia de Respinus is an industrial designer who, among many, many, many other things, she teaches at Pratt, she's designed clocks with George Nelson, but we're going to talk about a logo she designed for a company in 1980. The logo, 12 letters in uh, pink and orange. Yeah, you see it every day. You might have purchased something from this company at some point today. 12 letters in pink and orange. Technically, I think it's 12 letters and an apostrophe. For one point, what famous company's logo are we talking about? Yeah, oh, it's, a, it's a sweet question and a sweet answer. That might, that might be a hint. <laughs> All right, how do we feel? We feel we're good? Have we taken our guesses? That would be, oh, I should have gone to that. Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts it is. Pretty sweet. All right, question number four. Getting tougher still, this is our sports question of the night. Oh yeah, we're talking about the iconic logo of the National Basketball Association. You see it right there, and not only do you see it, you see the man that the logo was based on, an L.A. Laker Hall of Famer whose nicknames, among other, include The Logo. <laughs> yeah, also The Clutch and some other ones I don't remember. For one point, I can give you a hint if you need on this. Y'all yeah. need a hint? Yeah. All right. I'll give you his initials. How about that? Yeah. That works. J.W. Uh, right, if that was going to help, that was going to help. <laughs> This is our only sports question of the night. But now you can go home and say you know this. All right, take, take 10 seconds. Write down any names that you can think of that start with J and W. You might, you might stumble onto it. All right, I see some final guesses being taken. Jerry West, Jerry, Jerry West, not Jerry West is not here tonight with us, but Jerry West, somebody did get that question right, which means it was, it was worth it. All right, last one, last one, you're going to, you're going to hate this, but I love it. Perhaps the most iconic logo you've seen today, the Google logo. You've seen it multiple times today, and you can see right here, this is all gray. I would like you 
to tell me the colors of the Google logo. Yeah, in order. You want a hint? I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint on this. Two of them are red, two of them are blue, one is yellow, one is green. I know, just put them in the right order for one very tough point. Thank you. I know, this one's a thinker. I'll give you a couple extra seconds on this one. Again, two red, two blue, one yellow, one green. And that, of course, is not the order of them. I would not give it away in the question. All right. Oh, I, I see some counting going on. I like it. All right, take the next five seconds to get your answer locked in. We ready? All right, get ready to be mad at yourselves. That would be blue, red, yellow, blue, green, red. And that, that was our first round of trivia. We have uh, two more rounds. They're gonna be happening after each, uh, each presentation. So now, hello, I think that's you. And you're using, uh, do you have the mic? Oh, yeah. Is there a you guys hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Hey, nerds. How's it going? Did anybody get all of those? Um, hey, uh, so I'm Peter Mendelson. I'm a book designer and uh, writer, and uh, I'm a moron because I got the invitation to do this thing from Ellen who I admire greatly, and uh, I didn't see that this was design and storytelling. I didn't know there was a theme. Um, and why I'm a moron is because I actually wrote a book about design and storytelling called What We See When We Read, which is a phenomenology of the reading experience, how the images that we concoct in our mind sort of are co-produced with the authors of books and how narrative tension is built through imagery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about that. <laughs> I mean, I'll try to tie in the things that I have up on screen with the idea of uh, design and storytelling as best I can. Actually, as I was listening to, uh, to Ellen uh, talk about her amazing book, I was thinking, can design be storytelling? Because doesn't storytelling imply that something exists in time? And I sort of got indignant in my own head. But then I saw the, I saw the cover that Ellen put up of my own. No, I'm going the right way. I'm going backwards, right? I saw... No, I skipped it. Yeah, no, I saw this cover and then all of a sudden it occurred to me that design uh, does in fact exist in time. And yeah, it does unfold, uh, but it's, it's, it's really, it unfolds for the viewer in time even though it's static. So I realized there is kind of an inherent drama to design in there. Um, anywho, uh, so I have a bunch of stuff here. Most of it is, oh my God, I don't know how to use a clicker. Um, most of it's recent work. Uh, and then I have one thing where I can sort of drill down into one particular process of designing a jacket for a book. Um, maybe I'll just go through the recent design real quick so we have time to do the process stuff because people tend to like that, right? Okay, so uh, I'm Peter Mendelson. I am a book designer. Uh, I've been designing, I've been a designer period for about 15, maybe 16 years now. I was a classical pianist most of my life. Um, I started playing when I was four years old. I, s I haven't stopped playing. I still play all the time, but I stopped playing professionally after conservatory when I was around 32 years old when my first daughter was born. Um, so design is still, represents a pretty small fraction of the, uh, you know, the time that I've been on the earth. I, I haven't been doing this a very long time and I know very little about it, which is why I did so poorly on that quiz. Um, but so anyway, I worked at Knopf, which is a publishing house for all of those 15 years that I've been designing until this year. I've just left recently. Um, and when I was there, there were certain things I was sort of known for um, this being one. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of covers for books on uh, what we call in publishing the backlist, which is sort of the canonical classics in paperback. And I loved working on those because uh, for a bunch of reasons, one of which there's just a huge bang for your buck. You know, I have to do a huge amount of reading um, when I'm designing book covers. Um, and 
not all of that reading is great. Uh, so uh, the other thing is that the authors are dead, so they can't object. Um, so, uh, and these, um, and I also worked on a lot of literary fiction, uh, things like this, um, and occasionally things, uh, magazines, uh, covers, uh, stuff for newspapers and, uh, music and whatnot, but mostly, mostly books. Um, and I'm still doing book cover design, uh, uh, recently, uh, David Sedaris asked me to work with him on, actually all of his books, we're redoing all of his books. Um, this is his forthcoming collection, uh, Calypso. Um, and uh, the titular story, Calypso, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a throwaway line, um, but in the way of David Sedaris', Sedaris stories, there sometimes the throwaway lines are the best. But he mentions a friend of his who belongs to something called the Wood Interpretation Society. So as soon as I heard that, I was just, oh God. Um, and that led to, uh, that project led to doing the rest of his books in paperback. Um, and the idea here was just that I was going to do the paperbacks as sort of a history of paperback design, um, which was really fun especially because I got to do the worst typography. Uh, I mean, I broke literally every rule here on this one here. But they used to make books like that. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and I work for all different publishers as a freelancer now, for Norton, um, uh, two other books for Norton, uh, for Grove Press, uh, this is one I was working, uh, uh, Rachel Kushner's new novel. Actually, I said something to her on the phone about a month ago uh, where I was asking her you know, what she sort of wanted for the cover of this novel of hers, and she started to talk in these very uh, big sort of uh, thematic terms, and I said to her, actually, well, you know, a cover has a plot too. Um, so just, yeah. I'm, see, I'm agreeing with you just slowly over time. I'm just getting there. Um, so uh, the Japanese publisher, I'm still the art director on Vertical Press. Uh, this is the guy that did The, uh, the Ring. Um, it's gross. Um, another book for them. I still work for Knopf uh, uh, and Pantheon. This is a series of uh, fairy and folk tales, which is sort of reimagined um, in uh, kind of uh, abstract and totemistic terms. Uh, uh, New Directions, which is my absolute favorite uh, client. They do a lot of literary fiction, a lot of books in translation. They let me get away with doing weird portraits like that and not putting any type on the cover. Um, uh, things, this uh, Journey to the Center of the Night and putting a tongue on it, which is also gross and fun. Um, I get to paint, which I very much enjoy and didn't really get to do that much, and work on books that uh, I've loved forever and ever. Um, and here are more of them. Uh, and I get to uh, have a goat on a cover, which is also fun. Um, that's a one-off for me. Uh, and here, okay, so about, how much time do I have? Okay, I was saying to, to Ellen that I'm a little bit logoraic, and once I get on stage and I start talking, it's very hard to stop me, so somebody's gonna have to tell me when I have, okay. Do, do I have five minutes? Okay, great. Okay. Um, I'm also a little uh, manic. Uh, so, Let's see, about three years ago, do you guys know who Italo Calvino is? Yes. Raise your hands if you, okay, excellent, that's great. You would, for those of you who do know, it's shocking that often I talk about this and people have no idea who he was. Who he was, for those of you who don't know, was one of the great uh, 20th century uh, novelists, uh, literary critics, publishers and editors, um, and one of my all-time favorite authors. Uh, I read his first book when I was in college, when I was 19 years old, and was just totally besotted with him. Uh, he was Italian, although he lived a fair amount of his life in Paris, um, and uh, he wrote a lot of books. And about three years ago, I, I saw his name in my inbox. Uh, he's been dead for quite a while. It was his daughter, and she had seen some of those backlist titles that uh, I was just showing you, and had liked them and wanted to know if I wanted to work on her dad's stuff. Um, this 26 books, I believe. Um, and um, when my feet touched the ground again, I said, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of directions that I worked on. I'll try to talk you through them a little bit. So I think the important thing to know about Calvino is that uh, for his fiction, at least, he wrote in a wide variety of disparate styles. Um, the first part of his life in sort of a stripped down kind of Hemingway-esque style. Uh, the middle of his life in what I think of sort of a fantasist or fabulous style. He's very interested in folk tales. Um, and a lot of his books of that period are, in fact, folk tales. Um, and the last period of his life, which is a very experimental and playful period, a kind of metafictional uh, 
uh, period. So it, it was a bit of a challenge working on these books because you're representing the oeuvre of a guy who was a shapeshifter and a table hopper. And, um, but that's one of the things I loved about him. Um, anyway, so uh, when, you're, when you're designing a cover for somebody who writes books um, who, that often draw the reader's attention to uh, the artifice of reading, He'll always remind you that you're reading a book. That was one of the games that Calvino loved to play. Um, one of his most famous novels, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, begins, you are about to read If on a, Night, if on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Sit down. Are you comfortable? Do you need to pee? Um, and uh, so my first idea here was to represent the book with a book. Um, and uh, I had this idea of a catalog of uh, 26 of these things sitting as if in an exhibition in vitrines um, and uh, that I thought it just wasn't clever enough. So then I thought, what if we took the old designs and just photographed them? <laughs> Which was patently absurd but would have been absolutely perfect for these books. Um, but nobody was going for that. Um, here's another one of them. Uh, but so this is sort of what some of these could have looked like. Um, but like I said, uh, it was a little too meta for them. and. So then my next thought was, well, what if, I always like when there's very little throat clearing with a book. Uh, what I mean by that is, wouldn't it be great if you could just start reading it in the bookstore if, if the first paragraph, the first lines were just there on the front of the book? So I started experimenting with that a little bit, but it looked kind of plain. So, well, what if, what if there was a little bit of imagery? Um, so then I started experimenting with this idea of having the imagery just run directly over the text. Um, but. Uh, in the end, I found that a little confusing. Uh, and, but then I had this really great idea. Um, let me see if I have this. Oh, I don't, do I? Oh, I do. That's great. Uh, I had this great idea. I'm going to describe a cover to you guys, and then I'm going to show it to you, OK? OK. So there's a photograph on this cover, the photos of a table in a well-lit white room. Try to imagine this. On the table are several artifacts labeled with small tags. These items are a bedroom slipper, a hand mirror, a green veined cheese, a starling, a small square patch of lawn, a brass telescope, a gecko, a human skull. Not obvious at first is the faint shadow of the photographer cast over the table. So that's what the cover looks like. <laughs> so it's designed as storytelling, I guess you'd say. Um, I thought of these as sort of ekphrastic, which is another thing that Calvino was great at, describing works of art. And honestly, I, I begged and pleaded for them to go with this. And I actually wrote covers for each one of these books. Um, but they don't look good on Amazon, quote unquote. So this is one of the great tragedies of my book design life. Um, anyway, so back to the... Uh, Back to this, I, I realized that actually the, the impact was really coming from the shape. So I pulled the shape out, and then I just started experimenting with drawing things on the shape. And all of a sudden I realized that actually that line, I drew this other line, and there was this sort of sword thing happening. And that actually opened up a whole interesting thing, this idea of uh, uh, an image that's sort of a double entendre. So you have the trunk of the tree that's a ladder. This is a story about a boy uh, who climbs up into a tree and refuses to come down because he doesn't want to eat his snails and uh, lives in the trees for the rest of his life. So the rest of this process was spent just coming up with these sort of visual double entendres. There's a, another book, and I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be very fast. There's another book uh, called Cosmo Comics, and in that book there is a story in which, a fantastical story in which an Italian village, they, they go out on certain nights of the full moon in boats with ladders, and they climb up to the moon. So I started to experiment with oceans and moons and so they all work this way. This one's called Difficult Loves, so the heart. You know, a single line, well, it could have been worse. Um, and then the whole set kind of works that way. Uh, uh, so, you know, you have a pepper with a crown, and anyway, so that's that. Um, and the one that I was mentioning before where he addresses you directly as the reader, you are about to read, we, we, uh, we made a, a mirror foil for the book, so you actually see yourself in it. And Invisible Cities, this is very hard to see, but uh, the city is actually 
pressed into the paper, otherwise there's, there's no ink for it. Um, so these are my two books. Uh, they came out about a year and a half, two years ago. This is the one on reading. This is the one on my work. Um, I also am finishing up this other book, which is about sort of the history of, of uh, book jackets and book covers and, and how they mean, what they mean. Um, and I just finished this this year. So uh, this is a, a novel. And uh, uh, Ellen's right, I want an episiotomy me for my brain. It was a, a very trying year and a half, um, but uh, look for that in the fall, and thanks for having me. That was real, I went really long, didn't I? I'm sorry. And I think we're doing more trivia now. Is that right? Yeah. All right. That's right. Oh, no, I don't need that. That was cool. All right, so, whoop. we good? All right. So round two, round two, we are back to trivia, and since we just spent some time talking about book covers, round two is our book cover round. So I'm going to ask five questions about famous book covers, the history of book covers like you were talking. All right, question number one. Earlier this year, Puffin teamed up with Pantone to release ten classic children's novels, each with a cover consisting of what they called the perfect Pantone color. For one point... What very famous children's novel was represented by PMS 12, A Bright Yellow? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the, other, the other types they would do was uh, The Secret Garden was just a pink, and Anne of Green Gables was green. What very famous children's novel had a solid yellow cover? I will say it does have something to do with the plot of the book. All right, so take about 15 seconds. I got uh, another hint. One more hint. One. All right. Well, I will say that even if you even if you have not read this book, you've definitely seen the film. All right. Here we go. Take your final guess. That would be. The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. Yes, it was the Yellow Brick Road, of course. All right. Question number two. Question number two. You don't need a big design to make a big impact. Every single one of Malcolm Gladwell's books are basically this cover with one small image on it. For the tipping point, it's, uh, it's subtitled How Little Things Can Make a Big Difference. What little thing that can make a big difference did I remove from this cover? Yeah. What little thing that can make a big difference did I remove from this book cover? All right. You want a hint? Yeah. It's I yes, it was it was a it was a it was a hot book. It was a it was a big a hot seller. That's 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 a, that's a way to give a hint on it. It was a uh, it was a hot selling book. Mm. That doesn't help. Yeah, it really it really blew up. I think that's that's another that's another solid clue. <laughs> you ready? A match. It was a single match. Yeah, it's hot. It blew up. I like those hints. All right, number three. Number three. We've already talked about David Sedaris a little bit, but we have not talked about this one. In, uh, for the cover uh, to his book, When You Are Engulfed in Flames, uh, the designer just used a 1890 painting called Skull of a Skeleton with a Burning Cigarette. For one point, what very famous Dutch painter gave us this painting and this book its cover? Hmm. I'll say, if you can name a Dutch painter, you're already halfway there. <laughs> All right. Yes, very, very, very famous. In 1890, 1890. So they're not here today. All right, you ready? That would be Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh. All right. Believe it or not, this is where things get really tough. Question number four. Question number four. Um, 
We're talking about modern book cover design. Uh, up until the late 1800s, uh, book covers were not illustrated. That started basically with uh, this quarterly literary periodical with illustrated covers by Aubrey Beardsley for a very tough point. <laughs> yeah, something, something I remember a little bit from art history and then... Mm. <laughs> For one point, what late 1800s literary periodical had Aubrey Beardsley covers? You want a hint? It was called The Blank Book. Fill in that blank, get a point. I mean, fill it in correctly. Just give me any word. The Book Book. That would be good for this round. Yeah, it's a colorful name. So, so now, now this is basically multiple choice. What color book did Aubrey Beardsley design the covers for? It's, it's not black or white either. I, I left the color out of it for this image. All right, you, you taking your guesses? The yellow book, the yellow book, all right. See, they start easier and they get a little bit tougher as we go on. Here we go, the final question in this round. The final question in this round, we're going to end with some real cover designs for some fictional books. In the 2014 movie, Listen Up, Philip, Jason Schwartzman and Jonathan Price play authors. And throughout the film, we see their book covers. For one point, what famous designer designed all of the book covers from Listen Up, Philip? I think, I think he's a friend of Peter's, right? So you just took a picture to send to him. Don't give my wife any clue. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess if, if, you, if you know Peter's friends, then that'll help. All right. Take another second or two. Good on time. Here we go. Teddy Blanks. That was Teddy Blanks. And that, I believe, brings us to the end of round number two. We got one more round coming up. Hmm? Oh, did anybody get all of them? <laughs> do, not, do not worry about not getting all of them. We went through these questions earlier and Ellen did not get all of them. And if Ellen's not going to get all of them, then nobody's going to get all of them. <laughs> all right, so I'll be back for round three in just a moment. But now, this is... Yeah. Oh, take that one. Cool. So uh, much like much like Peter, I, I too uh, kind of dropped the ball on this whole design as storytelling theme. But I think that's okay though, because um, with music, the analogy to storytelling is a little it's an easier leap than let's say book covers. So I want to talk a bit about the role of sound in design and experience. But I think first, um, it's. Ellen introduced me as the sound designer for Trashbot, and I wish I could say it was as simple as that because in my company that I work for, Man Made Music, I work with a team of sound designers, composers, musicians, you name it. And so it, it just makes that uh, question all the more complicated when my mom asks me, what do I do for a living? And I tell her I'm a, a creative director and a producer. And so she says, well, do, what do you make? And I, well, I don't really make anything. I actually just, I talk a lot and I get people to do the things that I ask them to do and then I judge them poorly or, or, or well. And then I say, that's great. Let's get it in front of somebody else. And then I don't take any responsibility. So then it's, it's also really complicated when um, I try and explain to my mom, who I love very dearly, what man-made actually does, because man-made does so much more than just sound design, although when I get into the meat and potatoes part of my presentation, I want to talk really, though, about sound design products and experiences. But man-made is <clears throat> a strategic music and sound studio. We score entertainment and brand experiences, and once again, that's one of these things that's really difficult for, for I think, um, you know, once again, my mom's like, so do you make music? Mm. Yes, but we do anything from, uh, if you see the AT&T globe up there, we designed the bunk, 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 bunk that you hear at the end of commercials. Um, <laughs> it, it put my kids through preschool, okay, guys? 
Um, we've done work for the Alzheimer's Association in terms of uh, developing scores that, that talk about uh, their mission. If you go to see an IMAX movie, the countdown sequence that you see there, that's us. We've designed that experience, so we're about introducing you to that experience. Hulu, if you're watching Hulu Originals, the three-second thing at the beginning of Hulu Originals and at the end of Hulu Originals, we designed that. We do a lot of work for NBC. If you've watched the Super Bowl or Monday Night Football on NBC, we score those experiences. Uh, HBO, if you watch feature presentations, da 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 So we will do multiple arrangements of that. Allstate, um, urine. <laughs> That one? No? Okay. Uh, I could keep going. There's a, there's a lot. But we, we do brand and we do entertainment. Like, the, for instance, Cartoon Network is up here. Um, there's a theme park in Dubai. It's the biggest indoor theme park in the world. And we did the, the soundtrack for just when you're in, it's when you're outside, but you're actually inside. But when you're walking around all the exhibits, there's a crazy little sound. sound uh, we call it the cartoonosphere is playing the whole time. And so in that case, we're designing an experience. Um, I could go on, but I'm going to move on to just one small thing I want to talk about today is the role that sound plays in design and experience. So I could talk about a million things. I could talk about branding. I could talk about scoring the experience. But I just want to focus in on um, sound as an element in design. And so if there's one thing that you guys walk away with from what I talk about, it's as you interact with devices, products, objects, experiences, I want you to think about what is the sound telling me? What role is sound playing in this experience? So it's, it's kind of more for you guys to think about. It's more of an open-ended question. So I'm going to, uh, as I thought deeper about this, I ended up putting this, this question, what role does sound play in design and experience, onto a spectrum. I'm going to go through three things. Uh, once I got done doing it, I thought, well, maybe it's not a spectrum. Maybe it's like a triangle or I don't know. But I'm going to go with the spectrum right now because that's what I ended up with. And the first role of sound is, is feedback. So if I'm um, pressing a button, if I'm interacting physically with an object or I'm doing an action, that object, that experience, it gives me sound back. The next role that I, uh, I think about when I'm creating an experience is, is sound giving me messaging? Is it giving me information. In other words, I didn't necessarily push something to get a sound, and I need that sound for feedback, but instead I'm getting some sort of information given to me. And the last role, when this just an adorable little icon that we found, is sometimes the role of sound is to, <laughs> this is like designers and it's super, super intimidating. Um, the idea of uh, that sound can have the role of giving a product or an experience character. And so I want to drill down into like this um, continuum, if you will, of, of the role that sound can play in design. So when I think about sound and, and, feed, uh, and feedback, I can go back to an early analog of something mechanical. So before anything digital would have been uh, part of the experience, feedback sounds were just inherent in that experience. It's about the physical experience, and we all know that that kind of um, satisfying feeling that you can get out of certain physical interactions, especially when a product is made well. Um, but as we, as technology advances, we still have these button presses. We still have clicks. We call them clicks, even when our mouse doesn't make that that satisfying click. But the role of sound in this experience is still really important. It gives us feedback that my input has been received it's it's working the device is working and that's really once the physical part of it moves away it's then about establishing the connection in that experience it's real easy to have a connection to something like a typewriter or an old school mouse but once that physical layer is gone how do i establish connection and even a step further would be how do i establish connection if i'm doing something like with um alexa right now i'm no longer touching something now I'm using my voice and the use of sound to give feedback saying your input's been received is something that we have to think about when we're designing um, products that no longer have that physical interaction. So in messaging, I go back to, uh, I think, analog and I think about the, about the idea of bells being a very early way of sound in an experience messaging something. So I think about bells, church bells, they're telling me somebody's married 
somebody died, it's 12 o'clock. Messaging in terms of sound is always omnipresent in alarms. In New York, we know this quite well. Um, ringtones, <laughs> alerts, thank you. So obviously your phone is a, is a font of alerts and that's just, I'm not trying to say it's bad or, or good, but in considering sound and design, the role of it giving us an alert, a message is um, something we have a lot of, we probably get too much. But I think most importantly, with messaging, we're conveying some sort of information. So when I think about the role of sound in a, in a messaging context, a lot of times that's gonna be coded with information. What I think uh, this image is interesting because I've been told that all air, uh, airplane cockpits, no matter where you are, whatever country, they make the same set of sounds. So if you take a pilot in Mexico and you take a pilot somewhere in Russia, their cockpits and a commercial airline are gonna make the same sounds. It's because it's so important that that information maintains is the same across the experience. So I think it, gets, uh, it continues to get more complicated, though, as I go into the concept of character. So the role that sound plays in, a, in an experience, could it, can it convey the idea of character? And if it's just a person, or if I go back to the idea of what's the analog, voice, obviously voice conveys a huge amount of character, information around character. Um, I don't always need voice, though. I think the, uh, sound can give character in a very expressive way. If you think about R2-D2, BB-8, WALL-E, EVA, all those kind of like classic robots that we think of that are uh, super expressive, sound has the ability to, be, uh, to give that sort of expressiveness. And uh, oh, the idea of intelligence starts to come out, too. And I think this is really interesting as we interact with products and devices and experiences that are more than just, I'm pushing something, I'm getting a sound, or it's sending me some sort of message. Now I've got the challenge of using the sound to convey intelligence, and along with that, um, the idea of personality. So this is like a still from the movie Her, where the personality of this product is only through sound. It's only through sound, but it conveys something deeper than just in intelligence or being expressive. It conveys this idea of personality. So this is, this is more just what I want you to take away from this first little thing here is as you interact with your devices, as you interact with products, experiences, be it your car, your computer, your laptop, Think about, you know, is, is, what is the sound telling me here? Is it just giving me a feedback input? Is it successful in that? Um, is sound giving me a message that's clear? And this is sort of an open-ended question. I don't think every sound that comes out of a product at us, every sound that is programmed to, to just come at us is telling me a clear message on what I should do. Or is sound trying to convey some kind of deeper character in, in the experience? Um, so I'm gonna share just a little bit of work that Manmade did and just in this, just through this framework, this is just a small sample of some of the stuff that we've, that we've worked on. Uh, the first thing is gonna kind of come at you really, really loud here, but it's um, Disney Now, the, the interface for their streaming platform. As you might know, Disney pulled off all their content from Netflix and Hulu and launched their own platform. And so we scored that entire experience. What you're gonna see is just sort of a mock-up of what it looks like when you first launch the app on, let's say, an Apple TV. You're gonna select it. It's gonna have a, a musical score in terms of kind of greeting you to the experience, but then you're gonna hear these, I guess what I'd call them feedback sounds that connect you, if you think about you're sitting on the couch with your Apple, Apple remote, and you're clicking through these choices, we're giving you sounds that are giving you that feedback, but it also provides like an emotional context for that experience, and it has to be right for Disney, because it's Disney. So I'd select the app. You can turn it up a bit. Welcome to Disney Now. Create a profile to personalize your experience. Each family member can have their own. Thank you. 
just a real quick example of feedback sounds, but they don't have to be, one minute, they don't have to be cold, they don't have to be sterile, it's, it heightens the emotion as well. Next one's gonna be, um, totally forgetting what it is. <laughs> Once I find the designer who made this PowerPoint. <laughs> Stuff we did for AT&T, these are product agnostic. In other words, they're just generic light and sonic things for this welcomes you to an AT&T product when I turn it on. So it's like a combination of feedback, start a task, and then it tells me it's completed. This would be messaging telling me that it's going to sleep. Right, so you can kind of feel like my product's turned off, it's gone to sleep. It's sending me a message that's very clear. Uh, this next one is sort of a combination of messaging and character. I, under NDA, I can't tell you the name of that brand, although you, can, you, may, you may be able to guess what that is. What's really, what was interesting about that proje project, and let's be really brief on it, was when we started developing sound for this robot, we were like, this has to be just dripping with character. It has to be BB-8, and a combination of BB-8 meets, meets Mary Poppins. It's gonna be your expressive and sprightly helper. And we actually over-rotated. We gave the machine too much personality, and we had to kind of dial it back to a place where it was messaging me something much simpler. Um, interesting place to be. Uh, last thing I wanna show you is just something that people don't think about in terms of where sound goes into design. Uh, working with a car manufacturer, I'm, I'm never sure when the NDA ends on this, I'm just gonna say it's a Japanese car manufacturer. <laughs> and we got to do the sound for when the car is reversing, which is obviously very much a message there, it's saying get out of the way. Um, but then we also had to design the sound for when the car goes between zero, it's, electric, it's an electric vehicle, when the car goes between zero and 30 kilometers per hour, it has to make a sound by regulation because we all know that experience when a Prius rolls by, you don't, you don't, you're not aware of it because it doesn't make the internal combustion sound. And so there's an opportunity, right? A, a regulation is an opportunity for us to put a sound in there that's going to obviously send a message saying this car is, there's presence here, but we have an opportunity to define kind of the sound and the soul and the character though of, of the car as opposed to just hitting regulation. So here's a little sample of it. we developed like 50 versions of that to try and <laughs> convince the client that that was the right soul of the car. And um, hopefully you'll hear that sound someday on the, on the road in the next couple of years and don't get hit by it. So that's it, that's all I got. Thanks guys. All right, and here it is, the final round. We're gonna play at Trivia, and uh, it's, it's a game that we just were playing. Uh, I'm gonna play some sounds, and I'm not going to tell you the company. <laughs> this time, it's gonna be worth points. So, here we go, round three. We're gonna start off. Originally, this was part of a Spanish classical guitar piece, but this noise is now better known as a musical trademark of what company? Let's do that again. <laughs> yeah, that is a, it's a strident noise. It's a, all right, have we taken our guesses? All right, have we taken our guesses? Are we good? That is the Nokia ringtone, the Nokia ringtone. All right, question number two, question number two. Since 1982, this sound has been rattling teeth and letting you know that what you're watching was worked on by what company? You want that one more? 
time. That's right. If you listen to that, if you hear that, that means that what you're watching has been worked on by what company? You ready? That would be THX. That is, they call it the deep sound. The THX deep sound. All right. Question number three. We're going to go analog on this one. This trademark sound can be heard just around 500 times every calendar year. Where? One more time. And that's the only analog sound on our list tonight. All right, take a moment. Huh? Yeah, so it's, uh, we'll, be, we'll be real generous with the place you would be if you were hearing that sound. It's in New York City. It is in New York City. Yeah. You personally could have heard it. Maybe. All right, are we taking our guess? One more time? One more time. All right, you ready? That is the New York Stock Exchange bell. So if you're at the Stock Exchange, that counts. If you're at Wall Street, I'll give it to you too. If you're at Manhattan, not, not close enough. You needed to be closer on that. All right, here we go. Question number four. Question number four. This is a sound you've probably heard at the end of any of the 626 episodes of what television program, which has aired since 1989? And I know it says what production company. You don't need the production company. Just name the show. Name the show. It's been on since 1989, 626 episodes as of this week. They, they've got their hints. All right. I know they're supposed to get tougher as we go on. You want one more time? I'll give you one more time. All right, you ready? The name of that show, 626 episodes since 1989, The Simpsons. That is the Gracie Films logo that plays after The Simpsons. And we're going to finish things off. Here we go, question number five. 300 million people a month hear this sound while doing what? That's right, what company uses this trademark noise? I'll give it to you one more time just because it's fun to listen to. It's better than the bell. All right, we ready? That is the Skype ringtone. That is the Skype ringtone. And that was the end of uh, round number three, which means, yeah, which means you guys are geniuses and you got everything right, right? No. That's why we are going to give uh, our prizes to the top scores of the night. So take the next ooh, five seconds, grade yourself up. Honestly, honestly. This is what we call the reckoning. So, take five seconds, grade things up, and then we're going to give away some copies of Ellen's book. All right. We had 15 points up for grabs tonight. Yeah. Did anybody get 15 points? Did not expect that. How about 14 points? I know, we're going we're gonna to move this quickly. 13 points. 12 points. 12 points? Whoa. Wow, very impressive. 12 points. Whoa, PhD. All right. Here we go. How about 11 points? Did any team get 11 points? Oh, this was a, you ran away with this. What How about losers. 10 points? Oh. <laughs> 10 points. 9 points. Woo! There's a team with 9 points. All right. All right. 8 points. 7 points. Oh, and, I oh, I think, I think that's a, uh, what are we going to do for that? Uh, how many are there? <laughs> We're one team. One. Uh -oh. How many teams? teams one have person, to tear yeah, one the person on, per pieces. team raise their hand. <laughs> I think we have four more books. 
Four more books and. Woo! All right, we're going to. All right, what a great evening. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. This was super, super fun. Um, I would have totally failed the trivia. So, uh, um, so we have a little time. The the shop is open upstairs. Wine is being um, served for a, for a modest cost. There are copies of of my books and Peter's books. The process lab, which features the sound designs of man-made music, is open, so you can try your hand at actually designing sounds for a robotic garbage picking up machine called Trashbot. So check that out. Um, and it's just so so fun to have you all here. And thank you, Susanna. <laughs> she, this was all her idea, so we're really happy. Anyway, thank you to the great speakers, and um, congratulations for winning prizes. And just one note, so we're going to be wrapping up in here very quickly. So if uh, you want to stay longer, we'd love to have you. Just head on upstairs. So the guest speakers are going to be heading upstairs too. So thanks so much. And drinks are in the cafe through the bridge gallery through the shop.